Berwick Public Library. I'm so excited to continue bringing you quality programming through our partnership with Berwick Community TV. Our next guest is a main author, Matthew Langdon Cost. Mr. Cost graduated with a BA in History from Trinity College in 1989, and he began working on his first book, a historical novel about the Cuban Revolution. The manuscript was set aside for a few years while he explored several business endeavors. After 10 years as an entrepreneur, he decided it was time to follow his dream and began teaching, and his tenure began at Brunswick Junior High School. In 2015, after returning to his passion for writing historical fiction, Cost published his first novel, Joshua Chamberlain in the Civil War. It was well received by publications such as Kirkus and Civil War News, and it inspired him to become a dedicated full-time author. So after 30 years in the making, I Am Cuba, Fidel Castro in the Cuban Revolution is now published. Matthew Koss lives in Brunswick, Maine with his wife, Debbie Harper, and they have four children, Miranda, Brittany, Ryan, and Pearson. They also have a chocolate lab named Dog and a basset hound named Whimsy. So here to tell you more about his background and his book is Matthew Langdon Cost. Hi, I'm Matthew Langdon Cost and I'm here to talk about my recently published historical fiction, I Am Cuba, Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, I'm a history major and I was a history teacher and I stopped teaching about six years ago to uh, dedicate myself solely to writing and I published a book on Joshua Chamberlain. I had this book come out this last March and I have three mystery novels coming out over the next year based in Brunswick, Maine, my hometown. Um, so to get into the book, or before we get into the book, I'm, I'd like to address a question that is often asked of me. On what authority have I written this book? I'm not Cuban, obviously, so what gives me the right to write about Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution? Um, there's two reasons that I'm going to share. The first is I spent 30 years on researching this. I first got turned on to this subject back in my college days, so yeah, some 30 years ago, and I, uh, by a Latin American history professor. And upon graduating college, I wrote a rough draft of this book, and upon reading through it, I realized three things. First, that my writing needed to get better. Second, that my, I had to do more research. And third, to gain a sincere appreciation of my writing on Cuba, I really needed to visit Cuba. So, I spent the next 25, 30 years working on my writing, researching this subject, and keeping up with it, and until finally in 2016, I did a self-devised uh, trip to Cuba following the Revolutionary War Trail of Fidel Castro across the island nation. And uh, then I was able to publish this book in March of uh, this past year, 2020. Uh, the second reason that I really perhaps am the best person to write this book is because the history we know of Cuba falls into two distinct camps. The first is the carefully manipulated version espoused by Fidel himself that casts a very good light upon himself and his regime. And the second is the exiles that have been kicked out of Cuba, which as you can guess would be the opposite and uh, have a hatred of Fidel Castro and the regime. So as an outsider, I think I'm able to fall between those two camps of thought and really get into the guts of the truth of who Fidel Castro was in the 1950s and what the events of that revolution were. Uh, I'd also like to address what is historical fiction. Um, historical fiction can range from a romance set in the past that has very, very little to do with history to 
uh, the other side of what I do, which is very historically accurate. And the events and people are as accurate as I can make them through my interpretations of that history. Now, that being said, I do have a fictional character as a protagonist that I use as the everyman of Cuba by Zenti Bolivar, who casts a spotlight upon the events and the people of the Cuban Revolution. That being said, I would like to break into a little video trailer that's about three minutes long um, on I Am Cuba, Fidel Castro, and the Cuban Revolution. I Am Cuba, Fidel Castro, and the Cuban Revolution. Who was Fidel Castro? What were the events that made his rise to power in Cuba inevitable? On July 26, 1953, a young lawyer from Havana led a disastrous insurrection against the Moncada military barracks in Santiago, Cuba. The lawyer was captured, imprisoned, granted amnesty, and exiled to Mexico. In December of 1956, he invaded Cuba upon a pleasure yacht named the Grandma with 81 men. Only 18 survived. How did this band of bearded ones, as they came to be called, defeat the corrupt regime of Fulgencia Batista and his United States-backed military? It is in the Sierra Maestra that Fidel became Fidel. Che was working on his timing with the trigger, giving bursts of eight to ten bullets. The casing spinning out of the bottom after being fed in from the long clip on top. The past six months had been a difficult time for him as the hot and humid weather caused his asthma to act up with limited medicine to treat it. But here, now, in this heady, terrifying moment, he was truly a revolutionary attacking the forces of the corrupt dictator, fighting for the people. This was what he was meant to be, not a doctor, nor philosopher, but a warrior. The sharp retort to Fidel's telescoped rifle split the early morning air. A flash illuminated his position on the hill overlooking the El Uvero military garrison that was protecting the sugar refinery and lumberyard just east of Pico Turquino in the Sierra Maestra. Juan Almeida was leading the squadron given the task of taking out the northern post. This would allow Raul and his group to capture the barracks housing the bulk of the soldiers. Vicente was part of the advance guard unit under the leadership of Camillo Sinfigo. He realized they were out of position, slightly lost in the dark, as soon as return fire from the garrison began to light up the blackness. Celia aimed down the M1 carbon and pulled the trigger sending 15 shots in as many seconds in the direction of the barracks, the wooden stock slapping his shoulder in an oddly comforting manner. Working in the urban resistance had entailed hiding from the police by using constantly changing houses and disguises, but now she was finally able to confront the enemy. How did Fidel and his band of bearded ones turn the tides of war? How did 300 revolutionaries defeat 12,000 soldiers in open battle? I Am Cuba, Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution is an entertaining historical that will answer all of these questions about a man and an event that have had such a powerful and lasting impact upon the world in which we live. So, that brings us to who was Fidel Castro? Let's start answering some of those questions. Uh, to understand Cuba of today, to understand Cuba of the past 40 years, to understand the Cuban Revolution, we first have to understand who Fidel Castro was. Um, he was born of an affair. His father was a wealthy plantation owner that had an affair with the maid. And uh, him and his two brothers uh, were all born of this affair. and started their lives out in the servant quarters until uh, Angel Castro's wife mysteriously disappeared. Angel Castro was kind of a tough person, 
But when the wife disappeared, the maid and the boys moved into the main house of the sugar plantation, and he was, Fidel was eventually recognized and baptized and became legitimate. At this point, he was sent off to very wealthy schools in Santiago, the best of the best, uh, where he did not do very well with his schoolwork because he didn't apply himself mainly, but he did excel at all sports, basketball to baseball to ping pong to hiking and mountain climbing uh, were all things that he did very well. And then he went off to the University of Havana where he went through his schooling and then decided to continue on into the law school. And towards the end of his law school uh, tenure, he married his sweetheart um, who was actually the daughter of the lawyer for Fulgencia Batista, who is going to be his enemy during the Cuban Revolution of the 50s. Uh, he marries the daughter. She's very wealthy. The family foots the bill for them to take a three-month honeymoon in the United States, where he goes to Miami and New York City, and they have a grand old time before returning to Cuba and... Uh, finishing law school and giving birth to a son, little Fidelito. And at that point is when Fidel starts to turn against the wealthy and corrupt and also the United States of America. He becomes increasingly unhappy as his politics realize that the United States has abused Cuba for a long time, uh, dating back to the wars of independence. For years and years, Cuba had fought for their independence from Spain, and upon almost realizing that in 1898, the United States, under false pretenses, jumped into the war on the side of the Cubans uh, to help them, um, on the surface of things, uh, gain that independence. But in reality, it was to uh, determine the outcome of Cuban politics, and that's going to be showcased in the 1902 Platt Amendment, in which the United States, amongst other things, was allowed to have a military base in Cuba for all of time, Guantanamo Bay, and as well allowed for them to interfere in Cuban politics at any time, for any reason, whenever they wanted to. And they did this over the next 50 years, so that by the time of 1952, the United States pretty much controlled Cuba and most of the wealth of Cuba was owned by people from the United States Corporation and wealthy people in the government. The infrastructure, the electricity, the sugar plantations, the mines were all owned by the United States. When the 1952 elections were taking place. This man, Fulgencia Batista, was running a distant third uh, in the presidential race, and he decided to take matters into his own hands and completed a military coup and became the dictator of Cuba. Um, upon becoming dictator, the United States immediately recognized him for as the true leader of Cuba, and he began uh, getting involved in more and more con corruption and helping the wealthy elites out at the, uh, and abusing the poor Cuban population. Uh, it had already become the destination playground of the United States. Not all of Cuba, but Havana, Cuba, uh, solely is where people went, and all sorts of good times could be had. If you wanted something slightly more sinful, the Mafia controlled a large part of Havana, and that had become the playground of the wealthy set. So if you wanted to gamble, if you wanted to see dancing girls, if you wanted prostitutes, or just about anything that you wanted, you could get there. Many notable Americans frequented Havana quite often, JFK being one of them. So this is the Cuba that Fidel Castro, a 25-year-old new dad, new, uh, new husband, decides that enough is enough and that he can't take it anymore and he starts planning an insurrection 
to not only rid the country of Fulgencia Batista, the dictator, but also to uh, kick the, retain the wealth that Cuba had back to itself and get rid of the United States controlling that interest. And he starts planning an overthrow of the government in Havana. And it's on the eve of that first insurrection that I want to read a little blip of my book uh, from, from the viewpoint of my protagonist, Vicente Bolivar, the fictional character. Um, July 25th, 1953, Eastern Cuba. Vicente Bolivar pulled the 1952 Buick to the side of the road as he crested the hill overlooking Santiago. He was weary from the 500 mile plus drive from Havana, but the sight of the sprawling city below illuminated by the mid-afternoon sun at his back revitalized him. It was as if he were home, even though he'd never been here in his life. He opened the door and unpeeled himself from the seat, breathing in deeply the air that was his heritage, his birthright, and his freedom. At just 19 years of age, Vicente was embarking upon the adventure of a lifetime, a thought that didn't slightly hesitate as it raced through his brain and disappeared over the mountains and into the sea. His grandmother had told him endless tales of his ancestors, men and women who'd roamed this eastern end of the crocodile-shaped nation of Cuba. The day was stifling hot, the humidity rolling up from the ground where it was batted about by the strength of the sun rays, but Vicente didn't notice. His grandmother told him that his blood was made up of the soil from so deep within the history of Cuba that he could not be affected by anything so trivial as air temperature. He squinted his eyes to better see through the haze as he gazed in wonder to the left of Santiago, where the town of Barracoda must lay hidden behind the mountains. Over 400 years earlier, his ancestors, Guama, had arrived on the easternmost tip of Cuba. He'd accompanied the great chief Hatui and 300 warriors in long canoes who traveled from Hispaniola to bring warning of the impending arrival of the Spaniards. A shiver went through Vicente as he thought of the valiant battle these ancient Taino natives had put up for years before being all but exterminated by superior weapons, numbers, and disease. In Bayamo, Vicente had dropped five men off at a safe house. And then the road had bumped along the edge of the Sierra Maestra, a mountain range that his grandmother's grandmother had fled to after the failed Aponte slave uprising. The jagged land spiked its way into the sky, hiding valleys housing sharecroppers, tenant farmers, and bandits. Somewhere in those peaks, she discovered an oasis of black liberation in the areas of El Friol, a community known as a Palenque. In these rugged hills, this group of former slaves escaped detection for generations, and it was here that both his grandparents were born. When Jose Marti and Antonio Maceo had landed an invasion force near Barracoa in 1895, his grandfather joined their quest for independence from Sp Spanish colonialism. He'd watched both men succumb to injuries sustained on the battlefield, but the spirit of the revolution continued. Riding at the side of the legendary general Calixto Garcia, his grandfather had been witness to the growing swell that rose like the tide and swept the p Spanish interlopers into a cowering mass within the walls of Santiago. The Mambibises, Cuban peasants who had begun the war with machetes and now carried rifles, began to have their senses tickled with the sweet taste of freedom, like sucking upon the peeled sugar cane in the fields. Vicente could feel this history pulsating in his veins, his feet plunging into the earth as if rooted, while his soul soared through the mountains and his face was splashed with the sea crashing upon the rocks. He was home. He again rubbed his left eye with his fist. In 1898, with victory and Cuban sovereignty all but realized, the United States had swooped in and stolen, stolen their triumph and forced Cuba to be henceforth subjugated to their will. For the past 50 some years, this peonage had resulted in the advancement of the monetary interests of powerful American companies. Now, in 1953, the infrastructure and wealth of Cuba was foreign owned. His grandmother had painted the history of Cuba with broad strokes that resonated with his being, but it was Fidel, 
who had filled in the canvas by enlightening him to the tragic politics that had cursed the majority of Cubans to a life of poverty, poor health, and illiteracy. The green palm fronds glimmered in an almost translucent white in the glare of the setting sun. Down below, a peasant led his burrow stacked high with sticks. A chicken wandered the side of the road looking for food, and Vicente could see a ship, either coming or going, in the port. This serenity would all be shattered tomorrow. He climbed back into the car and continued down into Santiago. His first stop was at the Rex Hotel to pick up three men, and then the train depot for the arrival of Raul Castro. Fidel's younger brother had just turned 22, but his baby face made him appear much younger than Vicente. On the outskirts of town, they idled in the shade of a small cluster of palm trees until several more cars arrived. And then the caravan proceeded eight miles to the village of Saboni. A light on a tree signaled the th thin road to the farmhouse where the rebels were gathering. Vicente was one of the few who knew why. It was here at the Moncada military barracks the following day where Fidel Castro led an insurrection uh, with 124 men and two women. And they attacked these barracks in a poorly organized, chaotic, and against insurmountable odds. And it was doomed to failure. This is a picture I took myself. I, just to prove that I went to Cuba, I thought I should probably include a few of my pictures, but I'm not much of a photographer, so I think there's only three of my own pictures in here. But as you can see, the uh, front of the building still is peppered with bullet holes and whatnot. Um, and they've kept it that way as a sort of monument to this failed first insurrection. Uh, those that weren't killed in the uprising were hunted down and tortured and killed. Fidel and 30 others were captured, uh, but their lives were spared when the Archbishop of Santiago stepped in and forced the government to put them on trial instead of just torturing and killing them. Uh, one of the reasons for this probably is uh, the Archbishop had baptized Fidel years earlier and was a close friend of his father and the family. Um, put on trial, Fidel was separated from the other 30 survivors and put on a separate trial while they were tried together. And we begin to see his sort of legendary stamina in speaking skills, where he gives a four-hour defense, uh, ending with these famous words, condemn me, it does not matter, history will absolve me. Knowing that the judges could do nothing but find him guilty or they would be in big trouble with the government and the dictator Batista, and he indeed is found guilty and sentenced to 15 years in prison. After only a year and a half, though, he is granted amnesty by Batista under political pressure from other countries and people within the country. And as well, Batista is now feeling pretty solid as the dictator and not threatened by this Fidel Castro, this young lawyer and these approximately 30 followers that he has. Fidel, worried about being assassinated by the government, though, goes into self-imposed uh, exile in Mexico, where he begins training a force of men and preparing for invading Cuba to continue the revolution. And indeed, at the end of November uh, of 1956, he's going to board 81 men above a pleasure yacht, the Grandma, that was not meant for so many people, so it's overloaded. There is a plug in the bottom that they didn't know should be plugged, so it's leaking. And they hit stormy seas and rough seas, and the men not used to being on at sea are all seasick and whatnot. So they're way behind schedule in arriving, where they're supposed to have a reception of guides to take them in to the mountains to continue their fight. And at the same time in Santiago, there's going to be an uprising planned for the day of their arrival. But three days later than they were supposed to get there, they run aground on a sandbar 10 miles short of their destination. So this is a recreation that they do every year in Cuba. There was obviously nobody taking a picture at the time, but stuck on the sandbar with the sun starting to come up and afraid of Cuban aircraft coming over and 
bombing them. They carry their rifles overhead and wade ashore into a mangrove swamp. And because they're not in the right place and they're three days late, they are not met by guides to take them into the mountains and instead are ambushed and almost totally annihilated by the Cuban army. Uh, only 18 men and Fidel Castro survive. He survives lying in a sugar cane field buried in the dirt below it uh, for five days until the soldiers leave. And this is one of those cases where you have to find the reality between the exile's history and Castro's history. He likes to say that it was 12 survivors casting him in a Jesus or Messiah-like look and his 12 disciples, but in reality there were 18 survivors that were eventually found and guided into the mountains. At the time of when the, uh, uh, the arrival of the grandma and Fidel was supposed to occur, this man, Frank Pace, led an uprising in Santiago against the police and Marines and Army stationed there. And this uprising is going to be doomed to failure when Fidel doesn't arrive to split the army and distract from them. This is my second picture, uh, atop the Spanish steps where Frank Pace is action commander was killed along with a bunch of other men charging up the Spanish steps to attack the police station. Uh, I'd arrived in Santiago, I'd flown in from Havana, and actually I was supposed to get there the day that Fidel Castro was buried um, in 2016, but I got bumped from my flight and was a day late. I think there were more important Cuban people than myself that got on that flight. Uh, but anyways, we got in late at night. I was with my son. I brought him along as my interpreter. Uh, and we worked our ways through the darkened streets of Santiago. And uh, on a little side note here, in that walk through the darkened streets of Santiago and the rest of the time that I spent in Cuba, I never felt in danger ever. There's very few cities in America where I would feel comfortable walking down a dark street with uh, the people spilled out onto the street like it was in Santiago. But everywhere we went, people were intelligent and they were friendly and they were welcoming. And you never really felt like there was any crime uh, happening at all or that anybody had any intention of hurting anybody at any point. It's going to bring us to who was Celia Sanchez, because she is the person who organized the reception for Fidel and was going to have her guides bring him into the mountains uh, of the Sierra Maestra. But when he was late and he was short of his destination, they misconnected. Her people eventually are going to find Fidel and the 18 survivors and guide them into the mountains. But um, well, and she is going to continue to supply him with weapons and other things in the mountains for the beginning of his tenure there before she eventually joins him up in the mountains and becomes a guerrilla warrior herself and one of his top advisors as well as his lover for the duration of the Cuban Revolution. And one of the most important people that she brings in is Crescencio Perez, which is the man in the white shirt just to the right of Fidel, who was really the bandit lord of the Sierra Maestra, this 50,000 acres of sprawling territory that was pretty lawless and uh, uh, where the outlaw lives. And he uh, oversaw this and uh, controlled it. And he's going to become an early guide to Fidel and the guerrillas in the mountains, and eventually one of his top commanders in combat as well. Uh, the government claimed that Fidel had been killed in that initial army ambush and that the entire revolution had been stamped out. So to dispel this belief, Fidel uh, brought a New York Times journalist into the mountains to do a story, Herbert Matthews, and he brought him high into the Sierra Maestra. And during the course of the interview about what he wanted and intended for Cuba and what this revolution was all about, Fidel, amongst other things, uh, explained that the army soldiers worked in battalions of 200 soldiers. Uh, 
but he preferred battalions of 20 to 30 men because it was more mobile. And while he was saying this, his men marched by, and then they changed shirts and marched back by, and then changed again and marched back by, so that Fidel failed to mention that he had only one such battalion of 20 to 30 men at this point, which there were approximately 28 of them at this juncture that was the entire Cuban Revolution in the spring of 1957. Um, and for the course of the next year, they're going to not ever sleep in the same place two nights in a row. They're going to keep moving so that they can't be tracked down by the Army or the Air Force, more importantly, because planes, uh, United States planes, now Cuban-owned, were constantly on the lookout for them. But for the sake of this, I'm going to flash forward to the summer of 1958, and that is when uh, Fidel, after a little more than a year, had grown his force into 300 uh, bearded guerrillas, mostly men, but there was a unit of uh, women uh, that were part of the army. And these 300 guerrillas, or bearded uh, barbudos as they were called, bearded guerrillas, were able to defeat 12,000 army soldiers. Batista had decided to send the army in to once and, all, once and for all, you know, squash this menace hiding out in the Sierra Maestra. So 12,000 men, tanks, bazooka units, uh, the whole nine yards was thrown into the Sierra to uh, kill Fidel and his men. And how did they defeat him? Well, first we're going to look at some of the people. We already looked at you know, Frank Pace and Santiago, and we looked at Celia Sanchez, but let's look at probably the top strategist, top military commander, not even a Cuban, but an Argentinian, Che Guevara. Um, and this Che Guevara met Fidel in Mexico when he was in exile there, and he came to Cuba aboard the Grandma and rose through the ranks and became one of his top commanders. Uh, first of all, he was one of the 18 survivors, but then he became a top commander. And then, of course, there is his younger brother, who at the outset of the revolution was just 22 years old, Raul Castro, who is going to become a top commander and then is actually going to go open a second front in the spring of 1958 uh, in the Sierra Crystal Mountains, which is just north of Santiago whereas the Sierra Maestra is just west of Santiago. And Juan Ameda, who was a grave digger when Fidel found him in 1952 and brought him into the organization, which went through various names, um, but finally became the July 26 movement. Uh, and Juan Ameda is going to follow Fidel to the uprising at Moncada and survive that. He's going to be sent to prison along with Fidel. He's going to go into exile in Mexico. He's going to return upon the grandma. And then he becomes a top commander. As does Camillo Sinfigos, who was working in a haberdashery in Havana in 1952 when Fidel found him and he's going to follow all those same steps. Um, Camillo was known for his daring and when he ambushed uh, army soldier units he would often shoot the lead man in the unit when they were so close that he could catch the rifle of the man before it hit the ground and turn it around and use that weapon as well to fire back on, upon the other soldiers. So, he was known for his daring. And then, of course, there is the terrain. Um, not only were there dedicated soldiers and fantastic leaders, but the terrain of the Sierra Maestra was very difficult. Uh, on top of this um, map over here, you see Bayamo, and that is where the Cuban army is going to uh, strike from. And, try and enter in. And across from that is Gaisa, where Che Guevara has a unit of men that he is going to confound the army and ambush and ha harass and harry them so that they have very little luck. Uh, 
So then the Navy tries to come in on the other side from the Caribbean Sea here into La Plata on the bottom, which is where Fidel Castro has his command post. And this is also going to fail as they land men there and Fidel is able to harass, surround, and capture them. But why is this possible, 300 against 12,000? And this is probably the most important thing that I found out on my trip to Cuba when I spoke of needing to understand and being sincere about writing about Cuba is one of the things I did was I climbed the Sierra Maestra on a guided tour up to the command post, which still exists today and has been preserved as a monument for uh, Cuba. And between, and it was December, but between the heat, which is in the high 90s, and humid, incredibly humid, and the rugged terrain, even though there was now a path, and the thick foliage, I began to have an idea of how, you know, the army could be ambushed and defeated as they struggled to root out the, the Barbudos in the, in the jungle up there, as you will. I didn't get very many good pictures from this either as well, because every time we stopped, I was pretty much flat on my bas back gasping for air. But uh, I, this, this is one of my pictures, as is this. This is the hut where Fidel Castro and Celia Sanchez shared, as well as where they had strategy meetings and whatnot built into the side of the mountain. Down below it, it drops probably two to 300 feet directly down into a ravine. And there was a ladder down that that they could escape if they were found or if the bombers came overhead. And there were 12 or 13 other structures like that for the other men and for other business and uh, things, including a radio tower that by the summer of 1958, they were able to broadcast over their radio band the truth of what the uh, was happening in the mountains and what Batista was doing because he tried to pass a lot of false information off. But you're going to have to read the book to really get the details of how they defeated them. But they did eventually drive the army from the mountains and put them into retreat. And at that point, Fidel sent his top two commanders, Che Guevara and Camilla Sinfigos, to bring the attack across the island nation to the capital of Havana. And it is here in Santa Clara, about halfway across Cuba, that Che Guevara is going to win the last battle of the Cuban Revolution, and probably the most important. When it's uh, the army soldiers report to Batista that they're not going to be able to hold uh, Santa Clara and that the rebels would be continuing on to Havana. At that point, Fulgencia Batista loaded his closest friends and confidence and family onto three airplanes and fled Cuba on the early morning hours of January 1st, 1959. At that point, uh, Che Guevara and Camilla Sinfigos led their soldiers across and took charge of Havana, securing the victory for Fidel. And Fidel's going to follow across uh, from Santiago to Havana in a week-long process where he stops in every small town along the way and gives speeches to cheering crowds who have come to love this Robin Hood figure from the mountains. And many of them, if they have cars, they all pile into them and they follow this parade across until they reach Havana. But just short of Havana, in the town of Matanzas, Two o'clock in the morning, they're going to stop for an interview on the Ed Sullivan Show by Ed Sullivan himself, who has come to Matanzas for this purpose of this interview of this hero that has risen in Cuba, this Robin Hood figure. And Ed Sullivan describes this, you know, interview in, you know, this structure with these bearded gorillas, smoke swirling around from cigars. Um, Tommy guns waving in the air, Catholic crucifixes, you know, dangling from everybody's deck. And uh, there's just a real quick excerpt that I want to read from my book in regard to that because it, in 30 seconds here I can sum up what the United States and the world thinks of Fidel Castro. Um, Ed Sullivan is saying, 
The people of the United States have great admiration for you and your men because you are made in the real American tradition of a George Washington or any man who takes on another powerful nation and wins. How do you feel about the United States? Ed Sullivan asked. The people of the United States, Fidel says, are very focused and work extremely hard. I think this is because they've come from all over the world, places where they were mistreated and persecuted, and then came together in the United States to form a great nation. So that's two o'clock in the morning on January 8, 1959. And later that day, Fidel Castro is going to enter Havana. And that night, he's going to give a speech outdoors to millions of Cubans who have come from all over, not just Havana, to hear him speak. And he sp speaks about the peace and prosperity that he's now going to bring to Cuba. And as he's talking about the new peace, that Cuba's never experienced in all of their history. It's been a very violent history for Cuba, and that he's going to bring pre peace to the country. Three white doves flutter down from the sky, and one lands on his shoulders, and two land on the podium in front of him, and the entire crowd of millions falls to their knees, like they have just, you know, come upon a Messiah figure, and they truly believe that he is a god, almost. But it's not just in Cuba that he's loved. He's loved the entire world over. He's going to come to the United States, and hundreds of thousands of people are going to gather to hear him speak and to see him, because he is this Robin Hood figure. But on, there are signs that that's going to start to diminish, because not only is he kicking the wealthy people out of Cuba and taking their possessions if he finds that they were guilty of abusing the Cuban people. He's also kicking the Americans out. and He's reclaiming the wealth that the Americans have taken. And he's going to begin to nationalize businesses. And one such business that he's going to nationalize is the United Fruit Company, which is a huge plantation in Cuba. And the problem with that is, amongst other things, two large investors in that business are the Dulles brothers. John Foster, who is the Secretary of State of the United States of America, and his brother Allen, who is the head of the CIA. So you're going to find that uh, the United States government is going to start to push Cuba and Fidel Castro into a corner where they have no choice but to join the Soviet Union. Um, there are as many as 700 detailed assassination attempts on Fidel Castro's life, many of them generated by the CIA and the United States of America. And then the final straw is the Bay of Pigs, where the CIA backs an invasion of Cuba to try and over overthrow Fidel Castro. But none of that really matters in regard to my book, because I end on January 8, 1959, and it's not really debatable at that point that Fidel Castro was a hero to the entire world, um, whatever your thoughts now. Um, as I said, I did arrive in Cuba the day after Fidel Castro was buried, so I guess at least I missed the crowds, but I did visit his gravesite, and I think his memorial bespeaks who he was. Uh, in the Santa Iphigenia Cemetery, there were a lot of famous people of Cuban history buried, and they had these ornate, lavish uh, memorials to them. And then you came to Fidel's, which is a large rock that simply says Fidel. And that's who he was, I believe. And that's my talk today. And thank you for watching. And listening and uh, I'm happy to take questions from people if they want to contact me at any point. Thank you. Okay, so to address some questions out there, I thought I would talk a little bit about my writing process. As I mentioned earlier, um, 
I wrote the first draft of this Cuban book uh, approximately 30 years ago, back in 1990. Um, I always wanted to be a writer since the age of eight. I thought that that would be a fantastic life to have. Uh, but over the process of the years, I continued writing and working on my writing craft. But at the same time, I opened three different businesses, a, a fitness center and a bookstore, a mystery bookstore, which is actually where a detective, uh, Goff Langdon, is going to work out of in my new mystery series coming out over this next year, which is uh, my mainly mystery series of mainly power, mainly fear, and the third one, mainly, mainly money. And it is a mystery bookstore, and to augment his income from that bookstore, he's also a private detective. Uh, but I own the businesses, and then I taught history for 10 years in Brunswick, where I live, and continue to work on the craft. And I decided to break away and dedicate myself to writing in 2014. And at that point, I self-published my historical novel, Joshua Chamberlain and the Civil War at Every Hazard. And as stated, I just had a book come out this past March, I Am Cuba, and I have a mystery series coming out over the next uh, year. And I have three other books in the pipeline because my writing uh, style is that I write every day. Uh, that's what I do. I get up in the morning and I have a cup of coffee and then I start writing. I'm not saying I write all day every day. If something more exciting comes along, if I get a chance to go golfing, I'll go golf. But I will write every day and I sit down at my computer and the rest of the day I pretty much am thinking about what I am going to be writing because it really does become quite obsessive and therefore I never really have any writer's block or anything like that because I've already planned out in my head what's going to be the next step. And sometimes it's a little hard to get started, but I'm a big fan. I believe strongly once begun, half done. So if you start, you're well on your way to getting there. And so, you know, if anybody out there, you know, dreams of being a writer, and I would say there's only one way to do it. You sit down and you begin. If you have dreams of making money from writing, well, that's another thing entirely, and very few people are going to accomplish that. But to write and to get published is very difficult. I've done hundreds of queries to agents and publishers. Uh, I'm very happy with who just uh, Encircle Publications, who just published my I Am Cuba book and is bringing my mystery series out as well and uh, they've given me a great hands up, uh, hand up and a, you know, pulled me up. And as well, there's a family of authors at Encircle Publications, which is really nice to have. Uh, we often have Zoom meetings on uh, this day of COVID-19 where you can't meet face to face anymore and the authors just get together to chat and talk and support each other and come up with ideas and push each other forward, uh, which has been a very nice thing. I traditionally attend a lot of conferences, uh, but in COVID-19 times, those have all been canceled. So it's nice to have the Encircle Publication authors as a family at my back, as well as many other great main writers. Um, and I'm sure other places are the same, but. I feel like Maine has a really rich uh, history of writers and they're very supportive. So I've come to know a lot of authors who just support each other and push each other forward and it's a really good feeling to have. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? My book, I Am Cuba, uh, is available from any local bookstores. I, if they're not carrying it, they can order it and get it in for you. But it's also available from Encircle Publications, or you can get it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or any of the traditional ways. I believe that you could even come to the Berwick Library and read the book for free. <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? <laughs>